Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the audience for coming. I'm cognizant of the time. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, what I'd like to do in the next half an hour is to uh, go through some progress from our group relating to unraveling some of the pathways that underpin the molecular taxonomy of gastric cancer. So let's get started. So this is the question that our lab and many labs around the world have been focused on for many, many years and decades. And this is a question that Fatima has raised in her previous talk regarding the fact that in individual cases of gastric cancer from individual patients, these cancers look different. They look different in the level of morphology. They also look different at the level of gene expression profiles. And this is a paper from almost 15 years ago from our group looking at the first generation microarray technologies. And even here you can see that for individual tumors, there are different pathways of gene expression that give rise to different subtypes of uh, gastric cancer. And in 2017, 15 years later, we have all of these different taxonomies from the TCGA, the ACRG, and so on. Now, importantly, these subtypes of ca gastric cancer in the inter-individual and even within individuals aren't just related to the cancer cells. They also are related to differences in the tumor microenvironment, the stroma, the immune cells. And so what we want to understand is how are these different pathways triggered in different individuals ultimately to give rise to gastric cancer that, and what are the pathways that then can be targeted. So we all know that at the end of the day, what uh, manifests this phenotype or this phenotype is essentially aberrant patterns of gene expression. And one of the key underpinnings or the foundations that drive the differences in gene expression is the cancer epigenome. And this is a review that I've written with my colleague Toshigama Ushijima, uh, showing that the cancer epigenome in gastric cancer is aberrant at many different levels. You can have differences at the level of the modifications in DNA, so not just DNA methylation, but different variants that give rise to changes in expression. You can have changes in the histones that are the proteins that the DNA wraps around on that also give rise to changes in gene expression. And even at the level of the transcripts themselves, you can have modifications in the RNA that are interpreted differently by the cancer cell in order to give you different patterns of protein and gene expression. So all of these collectively integrate to give you what we term as gastric cancer. And we want to understand all of these different pathways and how they contribute towards the cancer phenotype. What I'd like to do today is to focus upon two recent studies from our group that look at this aspect of uh, tumor gene expression. We'll be giving you one story on looking at not the cancer cells, but the tumor microenvironment and the role of this stroma in driving disease progression in gastric cancer. We then move on to, to a more epigenome-based study where I think there's been a surprising link between the epigenetics that gives rise to this element of functional elements called promoters that I'll tell you about, and how it may contribute towards, I think, one of the hottest areas in the field today, which is this concept of tumor immunity or anti-tumor immunity. So I'd like to go through these two in the next uh, few minutes or so. So I think I want to start off this uh, story by looking at the fact that when we look at human cancers in human patients, we need to think about these as cellular ecosystems. So for many years, particularly if you are a basic scientist, you'd be, you're interested in studying cancer cells like this, which is on a plastic in the incubator and is purified cancer cells. So this is a typical gastric cancer cell line, and we do drug treatments on them, we do proliferation assays on them, and we publish on them in a, very frequently. All of us do that. But in reality, in the actual human patient, the cancers look actually very different. Not only do you have the cancer cells, but you also have these other aspects of the cell, of the, of the tumor. You have all of these, the, in pink are the stromal cells, and here is a more professional cartoon of the tumor that highlights that besides the tumor cells in, gr in green, you have the fibroblasts, you have the blood vessels, you have the immune cells, and it's really this ec ecology of different cell types that are interacting that drive aggressiveness, drive drug response, drive differences between inter in individuals. 
So we want to understand human cancer as, and particularly gastric cancer as a cellular ecosystem. And this is very important, particularly when we want to look at a very specific subtype of gastric cancer that I'm going to focus on for this first story, which is this diffuse, scurrous, undifferentiated, genome-stable subtype. You can call it by different names. It's all this, roughly the same feature. So from what Fatima has done is to highlight that we have known for decades that gastric cancers can be more or less subdivided into two different categories. There are shades of grey, but for the purposes of this talk, focus on these two. There's the intestinal type of variant and the diffuse type variant. The intestinal type variant is well differentiated, it's got typically better prognosis, and importantly, it has a number of targetable alterations. HER2 amplifications are found in this subtype, MSI tumors are found in this subtype. It generally has some ways that we can treat these cancers. Contrast that to the diffuse type of gastric cancer, which is very specific, I think, to the gastric cancer milieu, is that it's very poorly differentiated, very little adhesion, and we now know from the sequencing studies, from the copy number analysis, that there are ex very, very, very few targetable alterations. You it's hard to target CDH1. So we want to understand a bit more about what are the pathways that are driving the diffuse type. And the key difference in the diffuse type is that because of the, of the scattering of the tumor cells, there's a lot of stroma. So could the stroma be doing something in helping the diffuse type gastric cancers to do its thing, to uh, become aggressive? So this is a collaboration between uh, some colleagues from Japan, Kumamoto University, Dr. Ishimoto and Dr. Baba, in which we are trying to understand the interactions between the cancer cells and the CAFs, the cancer-associated fibroblasts in diffuse-type gastric cancers. And what we've done here is to highlight that these CAFs and these cancer cells in diffuse-type gastric cancers do something quite interesting. So I'll highlight here as a negative control, what we've done here is to take a typical intestinal type gastric cancer, this is the well differentiated, in green are the cancer cells, in red are the fibroblasts, and here we have merged them. And in the intestinal type gastric cancers, in typically the green cancer cells and the red fibroblasts tend to be fairly well demarcated from one each other. There's a basement membrane, they coexist in the same tumor, but they don't really interact that much. It's well differentiated. But contrast that to the diffuse type gastric cancers, and here are two cases, and there's a graph here where we can quantitate that, where if you look at the green cancer cells and the red fibroblasts, you see there's a lot more intimate touching and interaction and communication. They're actually touching one another. And so this highlights that there may be a very specific interaction that the diffuse type cancer cells need to have the interaction with the fibroblasts in order to do something so we want to understand that further. Now, we can only do so much by looking at these histological pictures. So what we've done here is to take surgically resected tissues from patients with diffuse type, scarce type gastric cancer. We can go for the, the gastric cancers, we can go for adjacent normal tissue, and by look, doing a variety of different markers, we can sort out the different cell populations in each tissue compartment. We can, we can isolate the endothelial cells, the hematopoietic cells, the epithelial cells, and for the purposes of today's talk, we can isolate the fibroblasts. We can get the normal fibroblasts and the cancer fibroblasts from each patient in a paired way. And once you have these isolated, you can do short-term in vitro cultures, you can add drugs to them, you can co-incubate them, and you can look at the types of changes that occur. And I'll show you some of that data in the next few slides. Importantly, um, while we do the sequencing of these fibroblasts, they almost have no somatic mutation. So these are not cancer cells that have undergone EMT, but are true stromal fibroblasts. Now, one of the things you can do when you have these isolated cells is that you can then put them back together and watch what happens. So I'm going to show you this uh, in a slide, just one data, where in green are cancer cells. These are diffuse type cancer cells from a diffuse type cancer patient. And if you just look at them on a dish, they just sit there, they don't do much. Now, if you co-incubate these cancer cells in green with normal fibroblasts, there's a bit of movement, but again, the cancer cells more or less stay in the same place, and the normal fibroblasts 
just sit there. Now, watch what happens when you incubate the cancer cells with the cancer fibroblast. Now, and watch this part here. You see that the cancer fibroblasts move much faster, but not only that, the green cancer cells get attached to the fibroblasts and they get dragged along with the fibroblasts. So we call this a tugboat mechanism. The cancer fibroblasts are moving faster, but not only are they moving faster, they're bringing along the cancer cells with them, which is what we kind of see in the diffuse type gastric cancer setting. And you can, and you can quantitate that by using this sort of graph. We hear that there is a increased motility when you co-incubate them with the calves. This is seen in vitro and this is seen in vivo as well. So here is an orthotopic model where we've injected the cancer cells and the calves together in the stomach of mice and asked the question, Do this, does this change local growth and does this change lymph node metastasis? So just to, in, in this case over here, you, have, you, you are co-injecting the cancer cells, the cancer cells with the normal fibroblasts and the cancer cells with the calves. And in terms of local growth, local cell proliferation, there's not much change, which is what we see in the human setting also. If you do a cell proliferation assay, a KI-67 assay on the diffuse type cancers, they don't really have much more uh, cell proliferation compared to an intestinal type cancer. But at the level of the metastasis to adjacent lymph nodes, we see that there's a significant increase when you co-inject with a calf, suggesting that the role of the calves in diffuse type cancer is to accelerate the pro-metastatic program, that seeding program. So we want to understand the pathways that are activated in the calves to give you that pro-metastatic program. So we've done RNA sequencing on the normal fibroblasts and the calves. And when we do a pathway analysis, we find that the top pathway that comes up is a pathway related to TGF beta signaling and regulators of TGF beta signaling. This is well known in the field. And in fact, if you oops, what, oops. Okay. And if you add TGF beta to the, can, the, the calves, you can actually begin to stimulate the movement of the calves. Now what is uh, what's a paradox is that when we look at the levels of TGF beta signaling in the normal fibroblasts in the calves, we don't see a difference, suggesting that the heightened response to TGF beta in the calves is not due to the secretion of the ligand itself, but must be something downstream. So we began to hunt and look at the genes here to see what might be that master regulator. After a lot of screening, I want to highlight you to one gene that we found called RHBDF2 or IROM2. Before I tell you what it is, I'll tell you why we're interested in this gene. It's upregulated in the calves compared to normal fibroblasts. There are different isoforms. It's not important for this presentation. But if you take the calves and you knock down IROM2, you convert them to normal fibroblasts. Conversely, if you overexpress IROM2 in normal fibroblasts, you convert them to calves. So this is a master regulator of that conversion from normal fibroblasts to a calf program. In the next slide, I'll tell you what IROM2 is, which is a gene that I think most of you may not have heard about. And actually, there's very little known in the literature. It encodes a pseudoprotease. What that means is that it looks like a protease, but look at the gene sequence, but it's predicted to be inactive. And its only known function is to mediate activation of another protease called ADAM17 or TASE. Now, this is a bit of a paradox because we know that TGF beta signaling is important. We know that this gene is important, but there's no connection between this gene and the canonical TGF beta signaling pathway that all of us learn about in basic molecular biology, where you have phosphorylation of SMATs, and many of the drugs that are targeting TGF beta are targeting this pathway. We were stuck here for about a year. But until we found this paper published in Nature Communications, highlighting that there is actually a connection between this gene, TASE, and the TGF beta signaling pathway, but it involves a completely different pathway related to uh, the, compared to the canonical pathway. In fact, in this situation, what happens is that TASE cleaves the TGF beta receptor, and the TGF beta receptor itself goes directly to the nucleus to stimulate gene expression. This is very exciting for us because it turns out that if this is, if calves use this alternative pathway to trigger the promethazine program, this highlights a totally new set of enzymes and uh, genes that we can target in order to maybe to target these calves. I'll quickly go through a few slides here to show that um, this uh, data is real and in the interest of time, is that if you add TGF beta to the calves, you can increase this uh, TGF beta increase the domain, you can increase the signal, 
And I see that the time is running out, so I will uh, go on and show that if you inhibit IROM2, you can reduce this pro-metastatic program. I won't go through a, into a lot of information because this is recently published online, but to highlight that spatial analysis highlights calf cancer cell interactions in diffuse type gastric cancer, CAS promotes second cell migration and metastasis. The genomic analysis highlights this new gene, IROM2, as a meta regulator of TGF beta metastasis. It triggers through the non canonical TGF beta signaling and highlights a potential role for this new class of medications previously used to be used in autoimmune disease and potentially in diffuse type gastric cancer. In the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, um, and I'll look to my chat people to keep me on time, I'll highlight another story that has highlighted a, diff a, a link between tumor epigenetics and tumor immunity. So in order to set up this story, I wanted to highlight that because of these epigenomic modifications, the changes to the histones, combinations of these different changes can actually highlight the different active elements in the human genome. So for instance, if you look at the region that is high in K4ME3 and K27AC, that marks a particular active promoter, whereas K4ME1 highlights an active enhancer element. So this is related to the, the key functional elements in the cancer genome that trigger gene expression changes. I'm going to focus today in this study on the promoter element, which is typically thought of as a very boring regulatory element. But if you think about it, the promoter element, which typically sits in front of a gene, is very important because it integrates information from all different upstream signaling pathways and enhancer elements to give you the pivotal decision on the gene. Do I transcribe the gene or do I not transcribe the gene? And it turns out that promoter architecture in the human genome is exceedingly complex. In fact, if you take any human gene in the human genome, 50% of the human genes have multiple promoters. They don't have just one promoter, even though we like to think of that when we do our experiments, but they actually have multiple promoters. And in the field of cancer, there are many examples of the same gene, but because of the use of different promoter elements, give rise to different types of isoforms that have different effects on cancer. The most famous is probably this one here, which is the WEF1 uh, P21 locus, where because of the, it's the same gene, but because of the use of different promoters, you have different protein products related to cell cycle inhibition. But up until now, there has been no study to date on a genome-wide basis and asking the question, how pervasive is the use of different promoters in any solid tumor, not just in gastric cancer? So we did this. Uh, we've, done, we've done chromatin profiling on about 20 normal tumor pairs of gastric cancers, some cell lines, and we're looking at three marks, a promoter mark as well as an enhancer mark, and we're looking for elements that are high in this promoter mark. We do about 23,000 promoter elements. Most of these, when we compare with the normals and tumors, are not altered. So this is a case example where you have a gene row A, and there's no difference in the tumors and the normals. But we see about 2,000 cases where there are changes between the cancers and the normal. So here's a tumor-specific promoter. This is a gene called CHIACAM6. It's high in gastric cancer, not in the normal, and this is, relates to high CHIACAM6 overexpression. This is the opposite case over here, where you lose the proton pump ATP4A. So you can begin to catalog these, and then once you know the locations of these promoters, you can begin to do things what is similar to do for gene expression and catalog all of these altered promoters. And what for, for this talk is that many of these promoters all map to these genes with multiple promoter start sites. And now we want to look at this because this hasn't been looked at before in the previous literature. This is a cartoon of what I'll be showing you, where you have the same gene and you have two different promoters. And we're going to be looking at cases where in the, no, the canonical isoform, there's no change in the promoter between the tumor and normal. But in the alternative isoform, there's a, there's a change. This is a, at a cartoon level. This is what it looks like in real life. Uh, Fatima highlighted the gene HNF4-alpha, and here you have the canonical promoter. There's no change in the promoter, but here in the tumor, you have gain of a somatic promoter, giving you to have a new isoform of HNF4-alpha, which also has different properties. This is known in the field, but here's a gene that some of you may be interested in, ATCAM, which is a gene that's used to, circulate tum uh, to sort circulating tumor cells, and again, you see the similar fashion, suggesting that ATCAM uses a tumor specific promoter. Uh, we can use this in, in a way to identify new pro oncogenic isoforms. I won't go into this uh, too much, but I want to highlight this very interesting example, which is a gene that most of you may know about, MET, 
which has been tried in gastric cancer and not worked in gastric cancer. And what we find in this uh, earlier paper and also reiterated in the uh, TCGA data is that there is an alternative form of MET that actually removes the N-terminus through a different promoter that actually removes the antigen that the MET antibody is targeting in the therapeutic trials. Now, what's the function of this is not known. So what we've done here is to express the wild-type variant and the promoter variant in cell lines. And if you can look over here, even in the absence of any ligand, the promoter truncated variant has constitutive signaling activity, suggesting that you don't need the ligand if you chop up the promoter in order to affect. And could this be a reason why some of the MET trials have failed? We don't know. This is worth investigating. Um, this is the highlight of the, of the story. It turns out that when we look at many of the promoters that are used in the tumors, you t tend to lose uh, the amino terminus of the protein. So we thought that this must be a reflection, not because it's trying to generate new cancer-promoting isoforms, but there must be some selective pressure from the outside that's tr causing these N-terminal promoter regions to be lost. And what could that be? We think it's the immune system. So what we've done here is to highlight all of the promoter regions that are lost in the tumors and done computational predictions, suggesting that these regions are actually highly enriched in peptides that are predicted to be highly immunogenic. And so this provides a mechanism that if you lose those, the tumors can reduce the antigen profile and therefore em evade the immune system. This is seen from the computational basis. And we've done a variety of different in vitro assays where we've taken all of these different promoter peptides incubated them with healthy donors and in different types of in vitro cultures. And in most of the cases, over 50% of them show a very potent immune stimulatory response when you incubate them with blood cells from either healthy donors or blood cells from cancer patients, suggesting that these are indeed very immunogenic peptides, suggesting that the tumor has a good reason to lose those, read those particular, particular peptides. Um, this is my last data slide. And here, what we've done here is that once we know the locations of those alternative uh, promoters, we can then begin to look at their expression in primary tumors and correlate them to other features of the human tumor immune system, like CD8 level activity. And we're going to be looking at the correlation of gastric cancers with a high usage of these alternative promoters with two markers of T cell activity, granzyme A and perforin A, perforin 1, that are markers of T cell cytolytic activity. If T cells express these two, the T cell is trying to kill the tumor. Uh, we can do this because now we know that we can design a nanostring assay to specifically target those promoters. When we do it in a Singapore series, when the, between tumors that have high usage of the alternative promoters and low usage, there's no difference in the CD8 count. So the CD8, the, 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 CD8, the T cells are there in the tumor, but there's a significant difference in the T cell cytolytic activity, meaning that if you have high alternative promoter usage, the T cells are attenuated in trying to kill the tumor. This is seen in the Singapore series. This is seen in the TCGA series, where we can now infer the for location using RNA-seq data. And this is seen in the ACRG series, which is in the, the, the third. So in the three of the largest gastric cancer cohorts in the academic literature, we see the same pattern, that if you have high alternative promoter usage, you have re reduced T cell killing activity, suggesting that if you find a way to reawaken those, maybe we can enhance the antigenicity of these tumors and maybe poise them for targeted immunotherapy. So the model here is that we think that this is a novel, unanticipated aspect of tumor immunoediting. Tumor immunoediting refers to the process when the tumors grow, they must find a way to evade the immune system. In a normal cell, DNA produces an mRNA, produces a protein. Now, in the normal situations, these proteins are in the right place at the right time, they are lowly expressed, and so they are not immunogenic. But in a tumor, these are highly expressed, and suddenly you begin to trigger the immune system from coming in, because now it recognizes the immune peptides. So as a result of this, the tumors have to prune their upstream promoters to evade the immune system, 
And so this is an epigenetic phenomena, and there are epigenetic drugs that we can try to use to reverse this phenomena. So the, the, this is my last slide. This was featured on uh, this month's uh, the cover of this month's issue of Cancer Discovery. This is the largest catalog of epigenome guided promoted elements in gastric cancer. Tumor-specific promoted isoforms are widespread, frequently mapped to multi-isoform genes. They result in pro-oncogenic isoform, but collectively they decrease tumor endogenicity. And what I haven't shown you is that these are actually targeted by an enzyme called EZH2, and so by inhibiting that in combination with immunotherapy, we may be able to break tumor dormancy and increase the number of tumors eligible for immunotherapy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.